All right, cool. So yeah, um, right in front of me, I have a diagram for recurrent neural network model. The assumption for us to do this type of model really is falling under the time series data assumption, which means what? Which means in your data set, not only do you have different columns, different features, these features have timestamp. Okay, so what are data sets with timestamp? Temperature, right? Temperature has a timestamp. If I just tell you, yeah, the temperature is 70 degrees, you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Are you talking about 70 degrees in the summer or are you talking about 70 degrees in the winter? But you gotta tell me the time, right? Otherwise, 70 degrees means nothing, right? And then, of course, uh, if you're talking about um, GDP, they say, hey, the GDP of the uh, United States is, I don't know, a billion dollars. I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Are you talking about billion dollars 50 years ago? Or are you talking about billion dollars today? If your GDP is only a billion dollar today, you're kind of screwed, right? That means you're a very, very small country. But if 100 years ago, your GDP is a billion dollars, then, you know, you're probably some prince somewhere, you know, um, um, and your dad is like some emperor, right? So in this sense, exactly what that means is your story changes its meaning if the time changes, okay? So that's why time matters. So in other words, if you give me data set that has timestamp, then we better use a model that can take advantage of that. Okay, so that's the whole thesis here. You are in a slightly different set of um, um, data sets and the premise are different. So that's one thing I wanna say. Uh, second thing I wanna say is this. There are some projects that people do, that I've seen people do, that use image data, okay? Image data that has nothing to do with time, right? You take a picture, it's a cat, right? You take a picture, it's a dog. It has nothing to do with time, okay? But it turned out some people use the recurrent neural network, which is this model that's originally designed for time series data. And they use this model on images it turn out they get good performance. Okay, so what is happening here is it turned out that if you take a picture and how human eyes look at the picture has certain intrinsic order. And when the humans provide the label of these pictures, the information of how people read it and the order of how people read it is built in that labeling process. Right, I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm writing a digits, right? Let's say I'm taking a picture. This is my picture. I'm writing a I'm writing a number nine, okay, number nine like this. And then I go ask Sam, I said, hey Sam, write a number nine. Okay, Sam is gonna take a picture of his number nine. He's probably gonna write like this. And I go to another person, okay, another person is gonna come right and maybe write like this. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, the shape of number nine might look different. That's fine. But you always, always start with this corner and you end here. Does that make sense? So in other words, how people write the digit number nine in this small example intrinsically has a timestamp in it. And when they give the label number nine, that's the class of digit that they're labeling, that intrinsic order, it's built in that labeling process. Okay? So... What does that mean? That means some image data, you are actually allowed to use this type of model, even though recurrent neural network is originally designed for time series data, languages, temperatures, star price, has nothing to do with pictures, okay? But you feel free to do whatever you want, right? If this is your own discovery and if you figure out something else, that's good, right? That's good. So right off the bat, I just want to give you guys that intuition of, um, you are the data scientist and it is up to you and your experience to make the decision um, to plug which type of data in which type of model, even though the model is originally designed for something else. Okay, so I just want to start with that. Now, with all that being said, we can now dig into this model. This model has two versions of explaining it. The first version is on the left-hand side, which is um, some people call it the rolled up version, some people call it a folded version, um, which has this red circle that kind of 
you know, loops back into it and you have arrow come from input to hidden, another arrow come from hidden to output. Okay, so that is the a folded version. Now, this folded version might look cute and, you know, efficient, but uh, from tutorial perspective, it is very difficult to explain what's going on inside of it, which is why we also have the unfolded version, which is this one you see on the right hand side. So in other words, these two graphs, they are pointing to the exact same model, right? the exactly same. So now let's talk about this one on the right hand side. Okay. First of all, it is a time series data. Time series data means the input layer have features come with the time step. So in other words, what I'm really talking about here is these features, that like these are the features, they have time stamp in it. This one is maybe t equals to one, this is maybe t equals to two, and this maybe t equals to three, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, the, the one thing, you know, uh, the machine learning people have a huge challenge working with like, like, um, people in like humanities and linguistics is they can't agree on time all right like you ask a philosophy major student or you ask somebody from math background and they're like well time has no beginning and time has no end and it gets into like a huge philosophical conversation okay in computer science we don't care about any of that we're looking at data right we're looking at data from this world this time right you're gonna have a beginning and you're gonna have an end Every article that you find online, every sentence, every temperature data that you find online, every stock data that you find online, there's always a beginning, there's always an end. Okay. The longest company that has been existing is probably like what? IBM. Um, what else? McDonald. These companies have longer span of history. And guess what? They have still a beginning and the end, right? So this T is not infinite. Okay. So we're talking about these three timestamps, right? That's the important part. These three timestamps. So um, that's the, what you have to know in regards to the input layer, right? That's where the information comes in, okay? The next thing is, of course, the hidden layer. Just like a neural network, right? You have X come in, you have a hidden layer, you make predictions, right? So this is the exact same thing here. You have input layer come in, you can kind of call that X, but here we use this letter I just for simplicity and, you know, uh, have a little distinction about it, right? Input layer come in, that's your information. And then you have a hidden layer. And then in a hidden layer, uh, there are some sort of activation here being calculated, and maybe you call that A1, and then maybe that's A2, maybe that's A3, and then so on and so forth. And then once that's done, you can then create O1. Okay. So here's a caveat. It turned out that these weights are all the same number. All right. Let me use a different color. So these blue arrows that I'm drawing right now. They are the same numerical value. Okay. This is the crucial difference between a recurrent neural network and a artificial neural network or convolutional neural network. This is the crucial difference. Okay. Um, recall what we've done, right? If you are in a neural network, you have x1, x2, and then you have an arrow here, you have another arrow here, you make some sort of calculation here. This w1 and this w2, they are different numbers. Okay, and then maybe you have another neuron, I have this and this, then there are also different numbers, right? Here you have four different numbers, right? Maybe this is W3 and then this is W4. In recurrent neural network, the neuron come from here and here, this blue arrow remains the same because technically speaking, it's the same um, connection, it's just the time changes, okay? You should not have a model that says, yeah, if the time changes, then I'm going to explain tomorrow by 20% of today. And then a year later, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah no, 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 I'm changing my story. I'm going to explain tomorrow by only 5% uh, uh, of today. You cannot do that. Okay, that's not how time series model works. If you're going to explain tomorrow using today 20% of the information, you better do the same thing today and a year later. If your story changes a year later, you have a different time series model. Okay, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say you're making a very simple observation. In the summer, right, every summer in New York, I'm looking at my calendar, it's like 60, 70 degree, right? Your story should be 
ah, if in the summer in New York, I'm observing one day it's 60 degrees, chances are the next day it's probably 60 degrees. Okay, that's, that story should not change too much. And as a matter of fact, in terms of how uh, RNN works, that portion of weight needs to be the same. Okay, then this year you respect that relationship, whatever it is. Let's say today you observe 60 degrees, chance tomorrow that has 60 degrees is whatever, 70%. Then you respect that 70%. Next year, it's still 70%. The year after, you know, 10 years later, hopefully it's still 70%. If years later, you feel like your model changes or your model needs to be updated, then that means what? Then that means the model is becoming inaccurate, okay? So that is, as a matter of fact, one of the um, um, fundamental um, evidence that people use to prove um, with hard evidence that we have global warming, okay? You look at this model, it changes, right? 20 years earlier, it's a different model. Today, it's a, it, it, you know, the model no longer works. You can't use the same model 20 years ago to make accurate predictions today. You can't do that. These weights need to be changed, need to be updated. So then what that means what? That means you have a different model. Why do you have a different model? Because your situation changes. Why do you have a different situation? Global warming, right? That's a hard evidence, right? So some people, they don't believe in global warming. This is this is how you convince them. <laughs> Not sure if they understand this, but this is how you're supposed to convince them. So these blue arrows, they are fixed numbers. Okay. Um, these uh, green arrows down here, uh, they happen to all be the same numerical values as well. Uh, of course, in the middle you have the red arrows. So I'll just use a red color. That is going to be the same value. Okay. Um, so with that being said, that's kind of like the intuition, right? Uh, now I'm just gonna show you guys math real fast. Uh, where's my math? Yeah, here. So this is a math form, mathematical form of that diagram I just draw above, okay? So I wanted to save some time today. That's why I directly printed it here. Otherwise I would have probably written down using iPad. Um, so let's talk about this um, mathematical form. It's the exact same idea from the graph I just showed you guys above, right? Exact same idea. So uh, first things first, you want to give a definition of what your data looks like. X1, X2, X3, that's what your data looks like. Now, we want to differentiate your X1 and X2 is different from the X1, X2, say, in the Excel spreadsheet, right? So in this case, we use what? Bracket. So when we say a bracket, that means time, okay? P equals to Y, P equals to Q. The X remains by itself the same thing. If your X is temperature, then this X bracket one means temperature from uh, say day one. This is temperature from day two and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's what the data looks like. Now, in this case, I draw it reversely. I kind of do that on purpose. And the reason I do that on purpose is because I want to show you guys, um, are you going, um, the forward propagation is not dependent on how the arrow works. The four propagations depend on where the information comes from. So you could draw the input layer on top, you could draw the input layer in the bottom. That doesn't really matter. Four propagation is defined from X to Y. That's four propagation. Okay. Whether you want to draw X top or bottom, that has, you know, that's independent. We don't care about that. So here I draw on the bottom just to show the distinction. The X are the feet are the information, it comes in. Every day or every timestamp, you have a new information, right? You have new temperature, right? You collect that data, that's the input. And you learn from that data, right? You learn from that input. First thing you do is what? First thing you do is a linear transformation. Exactly the same as the artificial neural network, right? Linear transformation. What does that mean, linear transformation? It means you are taking your x and you multiply by w, which is this way here, go from x to a, and then you can add a bias term if you want to, but you don't have to, you can set the bias to zero, you have to. Um, this is completely up to you, but it's gonna be some sort of linear transformation. Linear transformation means you multiply by something and you add something, right? As simple as that. Now, this is gonna give you Z. Z is gonna then be tossed into this hidden layer, and this hidden layer, which is exactly what's going on here in this A, uh, which you can call it activation, you can call it a hidden neuron, right? Uh, we've used these terminologies interchangeably. 
So what's happening with A is you uh, apply an activation function. An activation function, we talk about a whole lot of things, right? We talk about value, we talk about sigmoid, whatever, right? Here, uh, let's say I just pick sigmoid, then it looks exactly like this. So these two lines of code, or no, sorry, not code, these two lines of equation is exactly the same as a linear regression model and the logistic regression model. The only thing that's different is instead of calling your features x1, x2, x3, you're calling your features x bracket 1, x bracket 2, x bracket 2. It's that it. That's the only difference. So that's it. That's the forward propagation. So it's super easy once you can understand. If you can convince yourself about this timestamp key, then um, the rest of the stuff is super easy. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So that's the forward propagation. So once you go from X to Y, you have a prediction, right? The prediction, of course, in the beginning of the training, it's not going to be accurate, but hopefully in the end, after you do gradient descent, it's going to be accurate. So that gradient descent part, layer by layer, that is called uh, backward propagation. Uh, sometimes people call it feed backward. That's a backward propagation. So if you type out um, the backward propagation line by line, um, it kind of looks like this. And if you notice, um, if you look carefully, you have a loss function, just like what we have before, right? You have a model, right? You have a prediction y hat, and then you have ground truth y. Uh, those things are going inside of your loss function here in the middle. And, and guess what? You know, there's a difference, right? That difference is essentially uh, how many mistakes that your model is making. So um, that's kind of what's going on here in regards to this loss function. Um, my computer froze, I think. I don't know why. All right. So um, then, what, uh, what happened after that is you do a gradient descent. The gradient descent, well, recall that we have this nabla symbol here, right? This nabla means partial derivative. And the partial derivative basically means you take derivative with respect to each parameter. If your model has two parameters, then you're taking derivative with respect to these two parameters. Now, here's a small caveat that um, it might be a little bit um, out of the scope of this class, it might confuse people, but I'm going to tell you guys anyway because it's important. This um, special, I, I wouldn't call it special, but this is a slightly different partial derivative than what we've done before. And the reason this is different is because of the activation function. Now, if you watch closely, this activation function actually has a W here, and then uh, this is a hidden function, a uh, use activation function um, as an input. So in other words, when you're taking the partial derivative of this gradient, there's a chain rule that you have to apply for, okay? And, and what that means is uh, simply this. Uh, the easiest analogy I can give you guys is this. When you are um, uh, in the morning, you put on your socks, and then you put on your shoes, right? And you go to school. And then when you come back home, you take your shoes off, and then you take your socks off. You don't take your socks off first, right? You can't. So it's the same thing here. Um, if I give you some sort of um, function, let's say, let's keep things simple. Let's say, um, let's say f of some sort of uh, x is defined as 2x, right? It's a line, 2x. And then let's say uh, g of uh, whatever input is, um, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's say uh, x squared, all right? I define you this, I define you this, two functions, right? Very simple. Now I'm going to plug f inside of the g. Okay, so what that means is I'm going to do something like this g of f of x. This is going to equal to what? This is going to equal to, well, we do g first, right? So that's x squared. So it's going to be something squared, right? And then this is, oh, sorry, that, that should be z because this is z. And then this is z here, that's the input of this function g. I throw f in there. But f is what? f is 2x, right? So you throw 2x inside of here. That means you have a 2x here. 2x parenthesis squared, which is what? 4x squared, right? So this is going to give you 4x squared. So that's kind of how things work. And then when you take the um, uh, derivative of g with respect to x, Right, so you gotta do 
like kind of like twice, right? If this is an easy function, you can kind of look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's a result, right? Um, with respect to x, that's like what eight x, right? So four uh, x square. You can take derivative, right? Prime. This is gonna give you eight x. Done. But now I'm gonna show you guys how chain rule works, right? So um, what you're gonna do is if you want to take derivative of this thing, right? So g f like that. And you want to take, say, I'm taking prime, right? So you got to do it for uh, um, the uh, outside first, and then you got to do it for inside. Right? You got to do it twice. So what that looks like is you're going to do this thing first. So you got to write it out. G prime, what is that? That is 2z. And then a, uh, uh, f prime, what is that? That is 2, right? So that's kind of how things work. And then you have to plug it in, and then you have to recover this 8x. So let me know if this is unclear. But the whole point I'm trying to show you guys is um, the uh, order matters here. Because when you take partial derivative, your, um, um, you know, sorry, when you do the forward propagation, you are putting on your socks and you're putting on your shoes. But then when you do the backward propagation, you take your shoes off first, and then you take the socks off. You can't do a reverse, okay? So, um, all right. So let's just leave it like that. Let me know, you know. Let me know in break if this is unclear, and I'll explain more. Um, but for now, um, this stuff it's all coded in TensorFlow. Okay, you do not have to redesign everything. The only reason, the only scenario where you have to come back to the math is when your data is correct, when your model is also correct, and then. Um, you work out the code and the performance is super bad. And then you're like, okay, I don't have anywhere to go. Where am I supposed to go from here? And that's going to be a place where I would recommend that you come back to the beginning and you check the math a little bit. Okay. Um, or in some other scenarios, maybe someone's like, hey, you know, I have a, a new idea where I have a, a new loss function. Because who knows, maybe this loss function is not accurate, right? Uh, or maybe it doesn't solve our problem. So whenever you have a new loss function, of course, uh, these derivatives, you got to work it out. And you got to make sure that you can take derivative, you can do the chain rule, you can do all of that. Because if you can, then you don't really have a gradient descent, then the algorithm is not going to learn. Okay, so for the scope of this class, um, you can kind of pretend for a sec that there's no issue there, right? Because the data I'm giving you guys in the class, uh, I already checked those. Uh, so those problems don't exist. But you know, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of real world application. So in real world application, sometimes this can happen, especially when you use a different loss function. This stuff can happen. Like you could very well be using a loss function that what if the chain rule is not allowed, right? Then you're like, kind of like, well, if a chain rule is not allowed, then technically speaking, I don't have a gradient descent algorithm because the computer doesn't really know how to take derivative. If the computer doesn't know how to take derivative, then you're kind of screwed, right? You don't have an algorithm. Um, all right, so um, that's um, what I want to mention about the theory. Now, in regards to the code, it's something that's very straightforward. Um, the simple RNN, the, the entire RNN structure is kind of coded here. Uh, it's just one word called a simple RNN. It's kind of like the dense layer or kind of like the count 2D layer, right? Um, you just got to call the function and you tell the computer how many neurons that you want. And in this case, it's four, right? And then you're done. Um, so this part is super easy. It's one line of code that you have to memorize. Um, it's all like automated, you know, for you guys. Um, so if you want to use RNN, uh, this is what you need, okay? Now I'm skipping this a little bit. This is what we call an embedding layer. Um, an embedding layer, it's referring to the matrix form. And uh, before I go there, let me just talk a little bit about intuition behind this. So embedding layer, it's one way to transform your original data matrix. People tend to use embedding layer when your data is some sort of sentences. All right. So that's going to be one way that people find embedding layer useful. And I'm going to explain to you guys why it's useful in just a sec. But let me talk about the motivation first. If you are talking about other data sets, like you're doing, uh, let's say, stock data, or you're doing some whatever other time series data that you're looking at in your projects, 
this is a little bit questionable, okay? Um, because embedding layer is kind of designed for sentences. Can you use it for all data sets? Sure. You check the dimension. Uh, if you can plug in the model, it will work. Like the code will run. But doesn't mean that um, embedding layer makes sense in other data sets. Well, not really. You can have to check the data, right? depending on what data you're using. Typically, from what I'm seeing, um, embedding layer probably won't make a whole lot of sense in um, stock price prediction unless the stock price is standardized. Okay, I know one team is doing the stock price prediction, and if you guys want to touch this field, um, you know, make sure that you have this idea straightened out. So if you look at the original stock price, there's really no reason to use embedding layer. But if you rescale the data and all the stock price kind of in a certain level uh, goes up and down, then you can use embedding layer. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, other than that, I think you guys probably already figured this out. A dense layer, that's not that hard. Same thing as above, compile, and that's it. So now um, that's pretty much all the logistic. Now let me talk a little bit about this embedding layer. Um, where to go? The embedding layer is here. All right. So when it comes to embedding layer, here is the idea. Let's say I have a sentence, right? I have a sentence of, eh, let's say 20 words. All right, let's see. Uh, the sentence is said in the following. This is one of the best films, actually the best I have ever seen. The film starts one fall day, right? It's a sentence of a movie review is trying to, you know, explain the movie. Right, it's a movie review, so it's trying to explain the movie. The first thing you do is call one hot encoder. Everyone knows what one hot encoder means, right? You check the word and you check which uh, uh, index it belongs to. Um, the only difference is this index, if it's in natural language processing, it's called a dictionary. Sometimes people call it token, but they're really talking about the same thing. It's a list of unique words that serves as a dictionary that people refer to when it's trying to find the index. So for example, the word this, in whatever dictionary this data give us, it's at that spot. What that means is all the gray boxes are zero. The black box is one. So this now is becoming a vector of zeros and ones. Zero, 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 blah, 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 one. Right, let me write that down. So the word this is translated into a vector, this is a vector such that the gray boxes are all zeros. That's a zero, that's a zero, that's a zero. Da, 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 da. The black box, that's one. The second word is, it's translated into another vector. That's a vector, right? That's a vector. And the gray boxes are zeros. That's a zero, that's a zero, that's a zero, da, 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 da. and that's one. And then so on and so forth. You do it for every word, okay? Now, Here's a problem. If I don't do embedding layer, if I say, hey, I don't like this, I'm not doing that. I'm saying, hey, that's my data, that's it. I'm just tossing this data in my neural network, right? Next step. You can do that and the code will run. But the problem is you will have a data that has a lot of zeros inside of it. This is what we call a sparsity data problem, okay? Let's write that down. This is called a sparsity data problem, right? So what the sparsity data problem is referring to is you have your conventional data frame, but you look at the numerical value, they're like a bunch of zeros inside of it, right? And I'm saying sparse data problem as a general concept. It doesn't just exist in here. It's, the problem is, is, mag, uh, 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 is magnified in language problem. The reason is because sometimes people use like a Oxford dictionary, right? They're like 20,000 words in it. And then your sentence is like 10 words. Of course, the other all can be zeros, right? So that's going to be a situation where immediately you're just going to start overfitting the data. So the data is not going to learn. Right? So the problem with this is overfitting. Wow, that's terrible. Let me rewrite. Um, overfit. Okay, overfit. Overfit basically means your data has um, too many holes in it, too many features. Uh, the model doesn't learn anything. Okay, what is the solution? 
the solution is we need to figure out a way to somehow um like squeeze this matrix this one part matrix like squeeze them uh, to a much smaller dimension such that they have as many number as we possibly can to explain okay so um how we do it is what we call the, an embedding layer all right so um this stuff here this matrix is called an embedding layer there are two ways to create this embedding layer okay the first way it's a kind of like a transfer learning you go to a previously trained model you look at the index of uh, uh this word this and where that is pointing at and it says oh yeah this is this vector here done and the second word the uh, is and it becomes this vector and so on and so forth right the first way is a dumb way you look at other tokens that somebody else trained before you just you just borrow it the second way is kind of like a slightly smarter way but it requires retraining okay so the retraining means what retraining means well i kind of this matrix here but i don't really know what these values are i manually shrink this dimension down um whatever this is let's say um um that is uh, this is 16 right and this is a five so i manually shrink this dimension down like i squeeze this matrix and then it becomes five it's not 16 anymore it's five and then i let neural network to find all these numbers that's also fun you can also do that two ways right the first one is transfer learning maybe a little bit easier um but it borrows another model the second one is you have a train from scratch um just like anything else but the problem is it takes longer time training right pros and cons right pros and cons um with that being said that's pretty much all the building blocks that you have to know to do recurrent neural network now of course there are other advanced models um i'm not so sure if i have time today um but i'm going to give you guys this notebook and of course all the videos online and i'll point you guys to where these videos are um but for now i kind of just want to land on this and then i want to show you the code so this is the code for uh, building this model and we just talked about embedding layer we just talked about rnn right so now this is straightforward and then the next is what you just train it right you model out fit and then you throw the data in there and you just train it so um um so once you train it you're gonna have yourself a model such that um you will you will read in the x and produce some sort of outcome right uh whether that outcome is classification or regression uh, that's of course depend on you okay so that's what i want to show you guys and um um yeah and then um in addition on top of rnn this lstm and there's um this amazing um you know library or amazing package called bird um that i'm also uh, going to talk to you guys in the code uh, that really is a powerful tool that uh, google has developed to um, really um, help you to transform your words tokens into some sort of vector or um, some sort of matrices such that you can use to build new models on so um, with that being said i just want to kind of land there um, and give you guys a start of what recurrent neural network is and how people take care of some of the basic language problems um, and then i'll make sure the code is online and then from here i think i'm gonna probably um going to like a break and then sam will put you guys all in the breakout rooms um so the the name of the game for today is to finish the meat component of the project whether you're doing logistic regression or whether you're doing neural network um i hope that everyone get a chance to at least try uh whatever model that you're planning on at least once or twice today in like mm, the remaining two hours or so does that kind of make sense? And I'm going to be jumping at different rooms to make sure uh, no one's left behind and everybody's questions asked. Any questions so far? All right. Cool. If there's no questions, then take a um, five or 10 minute break and then you guys can just start working on the project. And I'm going to be staying here for questions. And Sam, um, whenever you're ready, just uh, put them in break albums. All right. 
So um, let's do a quick recap. Um, we talked about all the models, right? We talked about uh, last week. Uh, we were in the machine learning wheel, uh, machine learning world, linear regression, logistic regression. This week we are in neural network world, right? Neural network, convolutional neural network, recurrent neural network. So uh, of course, depends on what you want to do. Depends on what you want to predict. There's a regression problem. There's classification problem. So uh, now you guys are in the midst of doing the projects. Uh, of course, today, uh, hopefully, all of you guys have touched upon uh, the models that you want to do. And uh, I've seen, you know, the progress that some of the teams are doing, and I think you guys are doing great. So um, keep at it. And uh, again, things that you can find online, fair game, things I talk about in class, pictures, slides, code, whatever, like graphs, right? Fair game. So uh, take screenshots if you have to, just to make your life easier. Um, and all those things are... Uh, fair to use in a, a presentation slides. So uh, some people ask me uh, if they can find some uh, code online, Kaggle, so on and so forth. Can you use that code? Yes. So please feel free to use it. Um, other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, Thursday, which is tomorrow, we come back. I will take the first uh, 50 minutes to check in and give you guys a little bit more model, mo uh, models in neural network world. And then um, hopefully that will, you know, um, wrap things up in terms of the material. And then we'll, you know, open the room, uh, open the um, class for the breakout rooms for you guys to wrap things up. So um, my recommendation is tomorrow, shoot for finish all the way up to like at least 95%. Uh, that means all the code is done, all the results are done. You have all the slides and everybody know what they're talking and make sure your camera ready. And then in addition, make sure you have um, the uh, GitHub repo created. It uh, doesn't have to be everyone, just one person per team. Have a GitHub repo and throw all the things online so that uh, everyone can take a look and you have a showcase where you are. And Friday, we come back, we're probably going to let the first hour wrap things up. And the presentation will start from the second hour on Friday. So that's where we are right now. And uh, uh, today, I think we are um, pretty good at where we are right now. I will stay here for a couple minutes after the course. Um, but with that being said, uh, let me give you guys the survey. And then uh, you guys are, I once finish the survey, you guys are good to go. Uh, just give me one sec. So in regards to survey, now the uh, tone has changed a little bit, right? Um, earlier, it's a lecture. And then you go to lecture, go to code. And then uh, you learn from that way. Uh, right now, it's kind of like collaborative, right? So I'll be talking less, and you guys will mostly be working on projects. So it's much more hands-on and much more collaborative with your teammates. Um, so I want to also, of course, you know, um, have you guys fill out a survey for these sessions as well, uh, just to engage a little bit to see where people are. Uh, some people prefer to learn things by themselves. Some people prefer to, you know, perhaps. Um, um, do things a little bit more collaboratively. Um, so, you know, at a class like this, or with a size like this, chances are you're going to get a little bit of both. Um, we are trying to constantly improve ourselves as well, uh, you know, in terms of instructors. But um, I also want to engage you guys to see how you guys feel. Um, let me know, just honest opinion, if you're truly learning something from the group projects, or uh, maybe you say, hey, maybe I haven't learned a whole lot from the group projects. Either way, it's fine. Just let me know the honest opinion, um, and then I'll try to implement new ideas uh, to really make sure um, you know I can cover everyone and I can help everyone. Um, so yeah, so take a minute and finish the survey. Let me know how things go. Uh, typically, I tend to not to like babysit people too much. Um, what that means is I tend to let the question arise and then I'll jump in to solve it. Um, rather than, you know, checking students every five minutes and be like, can you do this? Can you do this? You know, um, so I'm like the, the latter kind of instructor, um, which also means that um, I kind of rely more on students to tell me what their problem is. I don't want to have to be nosy and checking with you guys. Hey, you know, do you know coding? Do you know Python? I, I don't do any of that. Um, so please let me know if you have problems. Um, no, there's no questions too small, right? Let me know if you have any questions. Um, and uh, yeah, once you finish the survey, you know, um, I think that's about it for today. And, uh, you know, feel free to drop out and I'll see you guys tomorrow.